Okay. If you could do me a little favour and look into that camera and her. absolutely, because you know, yeah, it's I, one of my I don't highlights. want to tell you how to make films. But no, well, someone should. So <laughs> yeah. Same stage. Uh, Richard, thank you for joining us in Waterstones. Thank I, you for having allowing me into the building. Well, it's a pleasure. I am gripping okay. the grip of film yes. here. Yes. Okay. Uh, your new book. Yeah. I say your new book, but it's it's one that you've helped shape. Sure. Shall we say? Yes. We can decide how um, how long the meta conceit <laughs> takes hold. Um, <clears throat> it's it's written by Gordy. Well, someone else pronounced it Gordy Lazure. Lazure. Which in some ways, I I always presumed it was Gordy Lazure. Okay. But I maybe prefer Gordy Lazure. Lazure has a certain a sort of charm. Cote Lazure. Yeah. Feel. Um, but you know, again, it's I, I don't wish to tell anyone to how to read it or to read it, <laughs> um, either of those things. Presumably um, you would want people to read it. Well, you know, not against their will. Okay. Um, should they wish to, our desires are in alignment. Good. But, um, yes, the idea behind this is that Gordy Lashore is a, 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 a not terribly um, sensitive, critical voice um, on film um, whose favourite film is Roadhouse and uh, a little else and has a, a, a very strong sense of how films have declined from their heyday which was largely in the 80s and which was a certain kind of macho cinema um, with a certain not too hidden belief structure underneath it. We're going to come to Roadhouse later because sure. I, I took the time to watch Roadhouse as well, a result good. of reading this book. Okay. I did actually almost feel compelled to watch it because mm. I thought m maybe it is a, a sort of a hidden work of genius and, yep. and that Gordy was right. But he gives a list at the beginning of the book of the kind of yes. films he's talking about. Yes. Quite a lot of them have the word cop in the title, Time yeah. Cop, Cop Out, uh, Beverly Hills Cop. Yes, um, Cop and a Half. Cop, yeah. yeah, I mean, they're all here. Quite a lot of Schwarzenegger films. Yes. Uh, it, that's the kind of territory we're in, isn't yes, it? Yes, Steven Seagal. Yeah. Um, uh, it's... Um, Yes, it seemed that there was um, a, a lot of films in the 80s which were kind of thinly veiled charters for rampaging vengeance and um, gaudy things haven't totally worked out for him. Um, he wanted to become a film director, mm -hmm. film writer, and um, <clears throat> no one was interested in what he was doing. And I, he slightly drifted in a sub Bukowski way to LA and eats burritos and shouts at students. And his theory, I guess, as expressed in this book is, is that, as you say, the, the 80s heyday of macho films is, is mm. what film is all about, and rather yes. than loser films like Citizen Kane and things yes, like that. Yes, films, well, in a way, I was thinking about Citizen Kane, what's odd about it is it's like, this is a good pretentious uh, phrase, is uh, I feel it's like a screwball tragedy, Citizen Kane. So it's really at the pace of a comedy, but incredibly sad, um, which is one of the many reasons why I think it's so great. But Gordy would just go, this is a ridiculously dull uh, film about someone, for some reason, not being able to enjoy how successful they are, hmm. um, which is just ludicrous. There's quite a lot of good descriptions of genres of film. You've, you've given Screwball tragedy there. There's lots right. of dramedies. Yes, sort of term dramedy. Yeah. Yes. It's almost apologising that there might be a moment that isn't depressing. Mm. Um, and so saying, you know, in case you're concerned that you may laugh, we, we shouldn't call this a drama or something. I, I like the idea of seeing on a Netflix sort of list of films, Screwball Tragedy making an yeah. appearance in the future. Yeah, Screwball Tragedy. Are there any other films that you can think of that might fit that? Or in Citizen Make Kane? Way for Tomorrow. Okay. I think has some of that, um, you know, it's a really sad ending. I think Bogdanovich has that sensibility. There's a sense in which you could say maybe Wes Anderson does that. Yes. Um, yeah. There we go. Okay, I want to get go. to Roadhouse now. Coin is a new term, but <laughs> it's of no use to anyone. <laughs> Roadhouse, mm. uh, a movie classic in many ways. Sure. Um, Patrick Swayze <coughs> yes. is a, a, a bouncer, yes. uh, or a bit of a drifter. Uh, yes. He finds his. Well, his he was an ex-philosopher, dropped yeah. out of NYU, 
and a, a big fan of, of sort of I guess it's Tai Chi, but some kind of yes, martial uh, yeah, not non art. I imagine it's largely of his own devising, but he does seem to be able to kill people with his fingers. <laughs> um, so I don't know whether that's I mean presumably that's black belts and above. Probably, you it's got know. to be a very high level. That's got to be not within the starter package of lessons. I mean, yeah. he, he, it's, it's a film which, as I say, I, I hunted out and okay. watched. Yes. Al as I say, almost, almost convinced by Gordy that it was yes. perhaps actually brilliant. Okay, how, how did you find it? Well, do you know what I found was really odd was that it's almost insanely um, homoerotic. Uh, sure. Because well. it's really a film about men fighting. So right. that literally 15 minutes passes and then there's another punch up from no There's a lot of bar reason. fighting. It's extraordinary levels of yes. bar fighting. Yes. And I was sort of re reviewing it as a counterpoint to Dirty Dancing because they're, okay. they're not separated by a huge amount of time in terms of when they were made. Sure. But they couldn't be any more diametrically opposed in terms of the, the feel. Similar of them. fonts. It's very similar fonts. Yes. Yeah, neon yes. font. Neon, yes, writing, yeah, neon. Big in the 80s. Yes, it was. Um, wh why do you think Gordy is such a fan of Roadhouse? And, and how, how do you feel about Roadhouse? I'm presuming well, you've seen it too. Well, you know, I like Patrick Swayze. I think he has a tremendous... I, th I think he's really good, Patrick Swayze. Um, there is something just very... Um, I like films where there's no subtext. And Roadhouse... <laughs> Um, it's one of those films, it really is, it will not leave the scene until it has told you what that scene is about. Yep. And so that I enjoy. Um, I like any film where someone has to come in and turn something around. It's essentially Gordon Ramsay's Kitchen Nightmares right. um, is the first part of it, but for bouncing. Mm -hmm. um, I like someone telling you how to bounce correctly. Um, it's a very specialised... There aren't many doormen films. <laughs> no. So as a sub-genre, I, I like it. I wish there were more doormen films, because I feel it's a rich pasture. Um, structurally, it is extremely easy to follow, <laughs> yes. um, which I enjoy. Also, I like seeing actors who are very good, um, like Ben Gazzara, negotiate the way through a film that is not testing their ability to act. No. Um, he plays the evil yes. poncho. Yes. Uh, and that's all he does. He just Every line he yes. says is just evil. Yes. And also, there seems to be a very strange trope in the 80s of kind of threatening anal incursion, as you say, with the homoeroticism as a threat. Yeah. As a worse threat. Yeah. Which seems a very strange threat. <laughs> Um, and also, it's also meant to be humorous, but it's really there's something very unresolved about it. Yeah. Stephen Seagal's always threatening that people will be penetrated by people he knows, yet he's supposedly very heterosexual. It's just the whole thing is ridiculous. These are all of, I mean, this whole section scream sales. Um, but uh, I, I like just its um, brazen. -ness. It's just no um, real sophistication. It has no pretension whatsoever. Um, no one thought it was the last film they'd make <laughs> in terms of that Bergman adage of make each film as if it, it's your last, you've got everything to say. Yeah. Um, everyone, I mean, probably people are moving on to a film the next Monday after Roadhouse. Yeah. Um, it just has that sort of efficient 80s thing of this is how films are. Th this kind of weird love of profanity. Mm -hmm. um, and just underlying it, a true hatred of weakness, <laughs> which I think was a, a phenomenon in the 80s, just an utter disdain for it. Yeah. Um, which I find uh, amusing as an incredibly weak person. Um, <laughs> I, I sort of like to watch films that I feel as if the, the film would detest me. <laughs> it's, I think it's exactly the kind of film that you would expect to find on a free, on a streaming service of films. It's the kind of thing that they would absolutely yeah. have on there. I, I'd hope. <laughs> You'd hope it's part of the basic package. Basic package, yeah. Just after BBC News. Yeah. 
you, of course, have made your own films. Um, um, yeah. Submarine and, and The Double, both adapted from books. Yes. I just wondered whether you had any plans in the works at the moment to, to develop any more films, whether they might be being developed from books, <coughs> anything you could tell us? Um, there's not much to say other than I've been trying to do some stuff and it hasn't um, particularly borne fruit, um, largely due to my own incompetence. So that's the narrative so far of that. Um, but yes, you know, before I'm mid-60s, I hope to make another film. <laughs> Um, but that may be optimistic at the current rate. <laughs> but you, you make that sound like you're not doing anything, but you're very, very busy. You're the host of the Crystal Maze. You're I'm not. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm here. You're I'm, <laughs> I'm entirely free. Um, so, yeah, I'm not really, you know... Um, also, making a film is like going to an oil rig, and I just uh, don't wish to currently go to the oil rig because I would rather be with my family. So, you know, when they're able to, let's see how long this metaphor works, <laughs> if, when they are able to also come to the oil rig, that might be more attractive. But at the moment, just the idea of mm. it is just horrific. Just going, it takes so long. When, you, as I say, you, you're doing several things at the same time, you're doing TV programmes, writing books, uh, making films, it, being a comedian, being on shows. I mean, it takes so little time, it's surprising. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know anyone on a sort of day-to-day -day level who does less than I do. But I just wondered whether there's one of those aspects which makes you happiest to do. I mean, I try to avoid happiness whenever I can. Um, so I, I, I like writing um, that it, w for the brief moments when you're kidding yourself that it's not terrible, it's good. And then you read it back, mm -hmm. and that's no good. Well, I mean, until we have another film from you, which I'm hoping won't be until yes. you're in your 60s. Well, I don't know if I'll survive that long, <laughs> um, but we'll see. I, I would say this. Um, I feel Donald Trump would like this book. I will say that. Oh, this is like his viewing list, isn't it? I, I, mean, I, I, I partially blame 80 Cinema for Donald Trump. I think there's a direct corollary mm -hmm. um, as a, there's a, a kind of specific dehumanizing that occurred in, uh, because part of the reason for writing this book is I realized um, I'd never really watched mainstream films, which is an awfully um, pompous thing to say, but um, the first film I really, other than Star Wars and Back to the Future, which I love, but the first films I remember watching were French New Wave films, and then I just went watching those things. So I hadn't watched any of these films before writing this book. So I thought I should write, um, not I should write, I should uh, watch some films that um, people see. <laughs> Maybe that would help. Um, and it was sort of interesting watching uh, films that are popular. Was it, um, what, I mean, was it sort of terrifying in a way when you see them and see how appalling they are? No, not really, because, you know, there are lots of really boring independent films and I can really sit, you know, they, they often feel like homework. Mm. That It's difficult because they can get rolled into one because, like, for me, I feel like Bergman films are really exciting and, and brilliant and just not boring at all, but there, there are lots of... He's like a once-in-a-generation genius, and there are lots of people who just aren't Bergman. It's just, <laughs> you know, it's really hard. You know, Fellini's really exciting, then you see this, you go, yeah. Not everyone can get away with not seeming to have much of a narrative. Mm. And the Jack Reacher films are really entertaining. <laughs> They're really good. Um, so I can see why you'd go for I mean, why wouldn't you watch Tom Cruise in a film? I mean, he's really, he tries so hard, continually. Like, he, he's not phoning that in. No. And it's a real pleasure to watch. He's just incredible. So I, I do see that. I just, I, when I started watching films, I felt I was so behind on the canon, as it were, that I just felt I... Watched and I've only watched five Herzog films. I need to watch the other ninety. Yeah. So um, 
I, it just never occurred, and then it seemed odd, you know, to sort of rent three days to kill. Um, <laughs> but I did eventually get round to it, and it's worth your time. Well, I was going to say, because Stephen Seagal features quite prominently in the yes. book. Yes, well, of course, that's Three Days to Kill is a, a G joint yeah. um, with Costner. But Seagal, I'd only, you know, I hadn't seen as much as I sh should even now. And I really enjoy him. I like the later films where he'll only play snipers so that he doesn't have to walk. <laughs> and um, I like the, I, the my favourite period is now, really, for Seagal because now they s just speed up the fights. So he just stands there, yeah. and then they just cut to his hand, beating someone up um, in, you know, sped up like Benny Hill. Um, and he's n no one's ever landed a punch on him, even in a film. Like, he, he will not accept that he could be harmed, which is, ex is kind of, an, he's like a mythical beast. And also an um, arms trader, like a literal arms trader. Yeah, I mean, his, his career has taken quite an interesting yeah. turn in recent years. He's an extraordinary man. Um, I think he declared himself to be a deity relatively recently. That's so well, he's leaving himself nowhere that. to go there. I mean, no. I mean, unless he goes monotheistic. That's true. Which I don't think is beyond Seagal. <laughs> That's Seagal there. That's probably somebody yeah, smashing making in slow motion through a plate, <laughs> or his body double smashing through it because he's too tired after growing his goatee. After after having watched all of those sort of films and catching up, as you say, on the popular canon, are there any of those sort of films of their ilk that you actually thought actually that's that's quite good? Well, they're all sort of good in their way. As in, I couldn't sort of write things out of just hatred as in you have a, a an affection for it and I don't know this I, I like pulp things I, but again I used to watch more like I love TJ Hooker but I would watch TV more than films I, I they were 18s and where I lived you know you'd have to go to the video shop I looked even when I was 15 I looked nine there's no way I could ever hire a 18 so and then it seemed in your 20s to be watching Steven Seagal as, you know post Nirvana this was you you weren't allowed to do that but I was you know sort of ostentatiously reading the female eunuch so um, I there's there are things to enjoy about it there's a certain uh, brio to them I mean I, I I quite like Red Scorpion. Okay. I think I quite like Dolph Lundgren yeah. as a presence. I like waiting to see how soon it will be till he takes his top off. Um, I like how patronising they are to all ethnicities. Um, I enjoy it in a way. Yeah, they're 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 sort of free from a certain kind of pretension. There is often an underlying incredibly disturbing right wing message. I was going to say there is often a sort of there's a they're punctuated by terrible puns of yeah. at the end of violence and yes. then there'll be some kind of cod philosophical or even as you say far right message that yeah. kind of, which is slightly disturbing to watch. Yes, and the body count is sort of very strange and, and it show there's a real um, yeah I I you do worry. About about what the effect of that thing is. Um, I mean, because you, you in, in a way, I find them, that you either approach them completely um, as if they're a sort of strange bubble, consequenceless bubble, where you, you kind of go into them. But I, it, it does alter, I guess, your um, barometer in a certain way of what's acceptable. and, as, and in a way that it makes real violence in film somehow seem more dangerous when it does occur in David Lynch or, mm. or, or someone who's doing it well, it feels much worse because you go, oh no, violence is meant to be consequenceless and you just shoot a lot of people and they drop down dead and that's how I enjoy violence, not with any form of empathy for the person who's being killed. Mm. So I don't know. No, I don't know whether that 
sentence has any point. <laughs> Can't even tell. Only time will tell. I think well, history will judge this yeah. broadcast incredibly harshly. <laughs> thought. Well, Richard, I appreciate the time you've given us uh, to talk about the Griffith film. Yes, I um, don't know that I've said anything that would convince anyone to, to purchase it or but maybe that's not the point. Maybe I've done due diligence in warning people that perhaps it's not for them. It's a service in itself. We could yeah. always, we may be able to tack on a sort of fight scene at the end of this that will... That would be ideal. Yeah. Maybe you can append some kind of apologetics for this at the end, should that be within your heart. I'll do that for you, Richard. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thanks very much. Well, somebody hand me a cue.